What difference does Easter make? I heard recently, we're going to pray in just a minute, I heard recently two people having a discussion, which is more important, Christmas or Easter, and it was interesting to listen to for about three minutes, and then I thought, this is just so foolish. <laughs> if you have one without the other, what, what's the point? But it did raise to me the, the thought, what difference does Easter make? And <clears throat> I think, if I'm, I'm not wrong in this, I think our immediate answer would be that because Jesus lives and conquered death, then we know that we will live eternally. And, and that's true, and that's a powerful thing by itself. But is there more than that? Because I think that's one dimension that's ever so important, but I think that there, there's something that goes wider and even deeper than that. And that's what I'd like to tackle and mull over and noodle with you right now this morning. Okay? Can we do that? Give me about an hour and a half and we'll be done and on our way. Let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O Spirit of the living God, open our eyes to take in the breadth, the depth, the width, the beauty, the power of what it means that Jesus was raised from the dead. How that affects our past and our present and our future. Open our eyes, open our minds and our souls to receive your word that we might know Jesus, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. Now may the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight O oh Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. So let's go right off to the first fill-in. Easter is absolutely essential to the gospel. That's obvious, yes? It's essential to the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, would you read it out loud with me if you have the outline in front of you? If not, just listen. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of all who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. First line, I deliver to you a first importance. What's a first importance? Look at these key words, and if you've got a pencil, circle them. In the second line, Christ died. Same line, buried. Interesting, isn't it, that he would say that buried was an essential word of first importance? We go from Good Friday to Easter and miss the essentiality of buried. Third line, he was raised. Same line, he appeared to Cephas. He appeared to 500. He appeared to James. He appeared to me. He appeared. These are the essential parts of the gospel. That's the difference the resurrection makes, in, in a sense, in a nutshell. Have you ever pondered what would happen if Christ had not been raised? What it would mean for us? Read with me 1 Corinthians 15 together. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sin. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's a pretty depressing message, is it not? If it were just that? <laughs> if Christ hasn't been raised, what are you doing here? Go to Trader Joe's. <laughs> Go shopping. What are you doing here if Christ has not been raised? It's all empty. It's all futile. 
preachers are liars and you're still in your sin and your loved ones are still in the grave. And you know what the next verse is, and it's not there in your outline, but you know what the next word is that Paul writes? But. Don't you love the word but? (laughs) Most of the time. But Christ has been raised. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. There's the word. But what difference? What difference does the resurrection of Christ mean in your life today? And that's where I want to now dive in a little bit deeper if you take a look. Number one, Easter proves that Jesus has the power that he claims to have. This is critical for us. Easter proves that Jesus has the power that he claims to have. John 10, 18, I'll read it. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to to lift it up, to raise it up. And I got that from my Father. If there's no resurrection, there's no proof that he... He has the power that he's talking about. But if there's a resurrection, it's a game changer. Because then every promise that Jesus has made to you, he keeps. If he kept this promise to be raising himself from the dead, is there any promise he cannot keep in your life? The Old Testament has thousands, not hundreds, thousands of promises regarding the Messiah. If Jesus does not raise himself from the dead, those promises can't be leaned on and counted on. But because Jesus raised himself from the dead, any promise that you have tended to turn to, what's your famous promise of God when you're hurting and when you're burdened and when you're overwhelmed? How do you know that promise is good for anything? It's rooted that Jesus proves he has the power that he said he has. He raised himself from the dead. So, true or false? Jesus raises himself from the dead. True. True or false? Jesus was raised from the dead. Passive sense. As if someone else did it. True or false? Jesus was raised from the dead. Oh, I heard mix. The answer is true. Take a look at Acts 2. Read it with me. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by. God raised him up. Jesus died for you. Jesus raised himself. Yes. But how do you know, if, if it were just that, how do you know that what Jesus did on the cross was accepted by the Father in heaven? How do you know that what Jesus did on the cross, that the Father's not ticked off at you anymore? How do you know? Because God the Father raised up his son. He raised up his son. It was the way the Father on Easter morning went, (laughs) nice going. I accept. Do you understand that? What Easter means in my life is not only that Jesus has the power, it's that my Father isn't angry with me anymore because he proves it by raising up the son. Your debt is paid. The ransom has been accepted. Just whisper that to yourself. The debt I owe is paid. Easter proves that Jesus has the power that he claims to have. Number two, Easter tells me that my past is forgiven. I love the the, the text in Matthew. Take a look at it. This is where it's so cool to be a Bible detective. The women go to the tomb and the angels are there. And of course, they're scared out of their bananas. But the angels say, just go to his disciples and tell them what you saw. Go to his disciples. Yet along the way, Jesus encounters the same women, basically saying everything the same to them, except one thing. He doesn't say go to the disciples. He says, go to my brothers. Do you know the significance of that? If you're Peter and you deny Jesus three times, and now the women come and say, Jesus told us to go to his brothers. 
Do you hear the love, the reconciliation, the forgiveness in that? In a moment, when we come to the altar with our prayers, how do you know that God welcomes us into his presence? Go to my brothers. Our past is, is, is forgiven. John 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. What doors do you lock in your heart, your conscience? What doors do you lock out of fear or guilt? And it's Jesus who comes and he says, Peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. This is the beauty of Holy Communion. I love it. After the consecration of the elements, when the pastor turns around and he holds up the vessels and he says, peace be with you. That's a Jesus moment. That's a Jesus moment in the locked room holding up nail-pierced hands and saying, peace, just chill out. Lay your sins there and come forward. Because your past is, is forgiven. Colossians 2.14. Read it with me. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He nailed what to the cross? We often think about the hands of Jesus, yes. But what else did he nail to the cross? Your debt. Your sin. Picture this wood as the wood of the cross. Picture my hand as the hand of Jesus. And it's going to be nailed to the wood. But between my flesh and between the wood was your debt. Your sin. That's the imagery being used there. Leave it there. If Satan throws it in your face, say, in the name of Christ, be gone. That has been paid for already. Your past has been forgiven. But what about the present now? Take a look. Number three, my present has power. My present has purpose. Ephesians 1. I love this, this, this section. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Here in verse 20, that passive tense again, When he raised him from the dead, not that Jesus raised himself only, but when the Father raised him. But it says here, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. And ask yourself as a Bible student, what does that mean, according to the working of his great might? What's his great might here? And the answer, if you look prior to this in Ephesians, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Chris, what meaning does that have for you? The same spirit that resides in you through baptism, yes? The same spirit that resides and lives in you because you are his, his holy temple. That spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And if ever there was a corpse that Satan and death did not want to let go of, it was the corpse of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit said to Satan, you're not getting this one. You're not keeping it. Now that spirit, imagine how powerful he has to be is in you. Don't tell me next time you don't have the strength. Does this make sense? According to his great might that is in you. I love the Living Bible, this translation is not in your outline. I pray that you'll begin to understand how incredibly great is his power to help those who believe in him. John 20. Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. My present has power, the Spirit. My present has purpose. I'm a person being sent. My dear first cousin whom I've known and loved and had such a good walk with, she lost her beloved sweetie of 60 plus years just a few months ago. And I called her the other day and we talked and it's hard for her to go on. What's my purpose? What do I get up for? And I said to her, I said, Jesus stood among people wondering the same thing and he said, as the Father has sent me, I send you. 
go into this day being sent. Sent to, to reach out to other people, giving them the comfort, the care that you're receiving on your end of the grief. Now, in turn, send it to, and give it to other people. Every one of us has a calling. We are sent by the Father into this life of ours. My past is forgiven. My present has, has purpose and power. My future, number four. My future is secure. My future is secure. What is one of humankind's greatest fears? Greatest fears? Death. Death. And if you look at scripture, you know what impresses me? It's how often, especially in the Psalms, the psalmists are afraid of being abandoned or forgotten. Not just of dying, but of being abandoned and forgotten. I know you're going to find this depressing, and I don't mean to depress you too much, but it's reality. That when I die, or when you die, 70, 80, 90 years later, there will be nobody on earth who remembers me. They'll remember the stories, maybe. But do you understand how fleeting? And if you're new in this church and you're thinking, this guy's depressing, wait till Pastor Adam comes, he's better. <laughs> but seriously, I, I think one of our greatest fears is of, the psalmist echo it, of being forgotten, of being abandoned. Take a look, Psalm 16. Because this, this was my, my fear as a young boy. I won't go into detail with smaller ones here, but because of many losses, I had a great fear of this. Blood, sweat, and tears, that, that group, I'll age myself, date myself. They came up with a song, I know there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell. And I, that was my song. I wasn't sure about heaven. I just prayed that when you died, you got annihilated. Well, of course, I have since found that to be unnecessary and so much more hope. But look at Psalm 16. Therefore, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, and you will not let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you were to look at my personal Bible at home, where I make personal journal entries, where it says here, you won't abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption, I put... I wonder what Jesus thought when he prayed this. Because Jesus prayed the Psalms, yes? Right? This was his prayer book. And so when he prayed this as a human, and yet son of God, I mean, God had never experienced dying. So did Jesus approach the cross, wondering what will this be like? But he found confidence to say, you won't abandon me. You won't forget me. And as a little boy, I found great peace in this that my future is secure. Acts 2, Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades. You won't let your Holy One see corruption. God in his wisdom inspired the Spirit to inspire writers to make sure they reflected, I believe, what is one of the greatest fears of humankind. You will not be forgotten. You will not be abandoned. And you won't see corruption. First Peter, I love this. If you've got a pencil, circle some words as we go to this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and here come the words, to an inheritance that is imperishable. Your inheritance is imperishable. Undefiled, it can't be stained, it can't be tainted in any way. And it's unfading. My strength fades as I get older. I can't do the things I used to do. I climbed a ladder the other day to go up to the top of my roof, and I said, Barry, you're an idiot. <laughs> what are you doing up here? <laughs> my inheritance in Christ is unfading. It doesn't lose its luster. To an inheritance that's imperishable and undefiled and unfading, it's kept in heaven for you. Dear ones, what difference does Easter make? Jesus has the power that he claims to have, and therefore every promise holds true. 
Your past is forgiven. Your present has power, the Spirit. Your present has purpose. You're sent. And your future is secure. In 1917, Nikola Ivanovich Bukharin, one of the head leaders of the Soviet Union, He, he was one that was a part of the Soviet newspaper and helped to communicate the lies and the falsehoods of that time. In 1917, he was part of the Bolshevik Revolution. Then in 1930, he went to Kiev and he spoke to a group of citizens from that town. And he, for about half hour, an hour, he just attacked the Christian faith. In the audience were all these Orthodox Christians. And he attacked it with such a vigor, firing one missile of criticism and one missile of, of, a, of hatred and disdain for the Christian faith. And when he was done, there were tears and there was silence. And he said, does anybody want to refute me? And it was so quiet. And suddenly this older, feeble man limping with a cane came up on the stage and he looked at this, this Russian leader and he looked at the crowd and as strong as he could with his weak, trembling voice, he said, Christ is risen. And the people stood up and said, he is risen indeed, alleluia. And he looked at the Russian leader and just smiled and sat down. That's the difference that Easter makes in our lives. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia.